the Tao. We're going to talk about the Tao and studying the mind. So you know, and I know, and we're we're learning about the default mode network of the mind, which is the autopilot thoughts that happen, that have an actual particular pathway that we can measure. We can see it. And the default mode network is your autopilot thinking brain. It's the one that's happening without you thinking on purpose. When you think on purpose, like when you set your intention, that's your intentional mind. But the default mode network works in the background. It runs all the time like your digestion. It's always worrying like this hamster wheel. And believe it or not, meditation actually slows it down. We have scientific proof that meditation slows down this highly measurable default network. And the default mode network, its job is to try to help you survive. That's what it wants to do. So it's always projecting. It's um, trying to figure out and remind you what you need to do next. And it's always ruminating and scanning the environment. But it's not intentional thought. It's not thought like when you set your intention for the week. It's autopilot thought. So those thoughts are definitely not you. They're, they're a program your brain has memorized from the past. But the future is not a duplication of the past or we'd be bored and we would never be surprised. So we need to keep an open mind, like a child's mind is what it's called in Buddhism. An open mind, be willing to see the, the world afresh each day. So the default mode network is why your mind is so full so much. And there are several things besides meditation that shift us out of the default mode network. Laughter does. Having a great time with friends does. Walks in nature calms it down. Creativity calms it down. Actually, a zoom out kind of perspective will help calm it down. But the default mode network runs, you know, keeps worrying along like thoughts on a hamster wheel, right? And so we want to gain the ability to detach or disentangle from that network and notice the times when we're able to disentangle from that network because it's a useful tool, but it very quickly takes over our lives. And people mistake it for who they are. So they'll hear a voice in their head and they think, oh, that's how I think. Well, no. It's not unless you are thinking on purpose or deliberately, you're the one who can observe it. So this is about how all we really want to do is stop and feel safe, satisfied, and connected. You might write these down, safe, satisfied, and connected. These are basic human needs. Your body is always wanting to feel these three things. So write down safe, then write down satisfied, then write down connected. Now, safe is basic security, right? But it's also social safety because since we have, we don't live in a, we don't live in a environment where we're worried about our physical safety all the time. Our default mode network, which is concerned about your safety, is focusing on social safety. And one of the sources of our anxiety these days is uh, social anxiety from um, all the different ways that we do social comparison and things like that. We'll learn how to shift out of social comparison. Satisfied is physically satisfied, your basic needs being satisfied. So when you get hunger, hungry, your body gets you up. It motivates you to go find food, right? So satisfied is your basic needs as well as emotional needs, right? So both physical and emotional needs and our emotional needs get very satisfied. One of the biggest things that satisfies our emotional needs is feeling connected. Connected is probably, and a feeling of belonging is probably our number one emotional need. So our body wants to, we want to feel those things and our body wants to feel those things. and. Um, the world is constantly disrupting our ability to feel those things. It's the nature of being on earth. It's the nature of being a human or an animal because we'll get hungry. That feeling of satisfied from, for example, eating won't last all that long. So it's the nature of our reality that these feelings will shift and change over time. That we won't always feel this way. So one of the things that we can do is cultivate, self-care is about cultivating our ability to feel this way when we need to. 
So how can we stop or even slow down the monkey mind? Now the monkey mind, you can see a little monkey behind me. The monkey mind is the, uh, the Buddhist term for the default mode network. What we have come to discover is the default mode network that is always running and worrying and going. So we're going to be exploring how we can help ease that and that we can do so purposefully. We can do things um, purposely that help ease the default mode network. So let's take a pause here and take a breath. Just allow yourself to take a nice deep breath and maybe jot into the chat when it occurs to you, what is a natural way that you are able to um, leave the monkey mind? For me, it's walking in the woods. When I walk in the woods with my dog, I have a place up here in paradise I love to go. And that helps get that, that default mode net work autopilot monkey mind to slow down for me singing that's a great one Kayla I so agree singing does get and I have been singing much lately I need to be singing on my my walk listening to music yes exactly so what you're noticing is that you have some natural things that you already do that help soothe or offset the default mode network and we want to create a collection of these for ourselves because we need to rest from that default mode network because it wears us out and it creates stress when we don't take regular rest from it. So this is carte blanche permission for you to be doing these things, walking your dogs, listening to an audio book, listening to music or playing games, exercise. You know, video games use music and sounds um, very... Um, skillfully to help us uh, feel, to tap into our emotions and help our emotions feel better. Okay, so our, our minds can do a lot of things on purpose, right? It can do a lot of things that we decide to do, like plan, imagine, and create. But the we can also make ourselves miserable by projecting fear into the future and ruminating on the past are usually the two methods that we do, which bring us out of the present moment, right? Because we're going fast, past and future. And it's helpful. It's helpful to think about the future and reflect on things about the future, but we can get into a habit of it. We can get hooked into doing it too often, right? Into becoming a sort of a addiction practically. So research has shown that one of the most effective ways for us to steady our mind and emotions is through mindfulness. And I, I think that each of these things that you listed, like riding horses and walking outside and listening to music, brings you into mindfulness. We can think of mindfulness as a kind of metacognition. Um, you have your thinking mind and it's behind the thinking mind. So it's a metacognition that can observe the thinking mind. It can also observe the swirl of emotions. So it's back here. It's like a light behind the mind. Um, that's what the mindfulness perceptual awareness state is. It's actually a heightened state of awareness compared to the state we often hang out in. So let's look at what exactly mindfulness is and how it is like a superpower. For example, road rage. Somebody cuts you off in traffic and you get upset you have an experience of an amygdala hijack and you get annoyed so what happens our default mode network which is into protecting us will make all kinds of justifications about why that person is such a jerk and go on a, a little bit of a rampage right or we can flip that switch off and it won't always be easy at the very beginning to flip the switch off but we can flip the switch off and go into another mind space. So let's take a look at um, what we're referring to there in terms of mindfulness. This is the wrong one. I need to open this one. And we'll take a look at this little video clip, which is really cute, about why mindfulness is a superpower. Oops, hold on, sorry. Stop this. All right. Where'd it go? There we are. 
become something of a buzz phrase of late. But I'm going to give you one simple, serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've done this. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometime? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you, rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. Okay, let me buzz back to this moment where he goes, ah, I felt that, right? Stimulus and your reaction with just a little bit of mind. And basically... Flexibly inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer, but... Okay, so what he's talking about is before, if you, when you observe this in mindfulness, these, like when this happens, you're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, you feel the reptilian, this is an animal response. This is a response of your bodily animal. If, some, if, a, if I'm at the park and my dog has a bone and another dog or a ball and another dog tries to get it from me, he's going to, my dog goes, Arr! Right? So this response is an automatic animal response within us to go, somebody cut me off. This is a natural kind of part of our animal nature. But notice how if somebody like your, your roommate or your partner says something to you and you hear it a little bit harsh and then you feel that harshness, but you're, you, and then we inhabit it, like he says, we be like, we feel these feelings within us and then we act them out the way our dog would or a three-year-old would. And so we respond to our roommate with more attention, you know, and so then we have an argumentative kind of conversation where our friend or parent or whoever. But, but if we're able to take a step back into the metacognition and notice these feelings back to this moment where he goes, ah, I felt that, right? Stimulus and your reaction with just a little bit of mind. And basically... Flexibly inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer. But okay, so what he's talking about is before, if you, when you observe this in mindfulness, these, like when this happens, you're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, you feel the reptilian, this is an animal response. This is a response of your bodily animal. If, some, if, a, if I'm at the park and my dog has a bone and another dog or a ball and another dog tries to get it from me, he's gonna, my dog goes Rrr, right? So this response is an automatic animal response within us to go Rrr, somebody cut me off. This is a natural kind of part of our animal nature. But notice how 
if somebody like your your roommate or your partner says something to you and you hear it a little bit harsh and then you feel that harshness but you're you and then we inhabit like he says we be, like we feel these feelings within us and then we act them out the way our dog would or a three-year-old would and so we respond to our roommate with more attention you know and so then we have an argument with kind of conversation where our friend or parent or whoever but but if we're able to take a step back into the metacognition and notice these feelings and thoughts and we go oh I'm feeling pissed. And so then we can begin to take care of our pissedness and soothe it so that we can react from a calm place. There's that space between feeling pissed and acting it out. We're not immediately, you know, put into the position of feeling like we have to act it out. Now you've all experienced this yourself when we're in a good mood and we hear something, somebody we love or care for says something sharp to us we have space in us where we're able to not take that in as a jab but instead see that they're having a hard day and we're able to respond with more finesse right so that's what this idea now the chapter this week is mindfulness and so this is what they're referring to we don't spend the whole course this whole course isn't about cultivating mindfulness but the exercises we do, like going green, cultivate mindfulness. We do small practices that cultivate mindfulness. We don't do it intensely through meditation, but we do a little bit of meditation. So we touch on it and we, we, we cultivate it a little bit each class in those ways. Um, that was um, not Sam. Dan Harris. <laughs> that was Dan Harris, who's a famous newscaster who had a panic attack online. And when he was like on, on a major news network, and he sort of hit it, so you couldn't really tell looking at it. But that's what led him down this field, was to try to find a way to help soothe his anxiety. And he's done a, an app called 10% Happier that you can check out. Um, and there's meditations on 10% Happier. 10% Happier meaning applying these skills and tools that we're talking about in this lecture and this chapter of the book to your life can, can toggle the needle of inner happiness by he's estimating 10 percent i think more but 10 percent so mindfulness remember i mentioned to it is a metacognition it's like cognition behind let's say if this is you this is you then it's cognition behind here so you when you observe yourself, when you're self-aware, for example, at the beginning when you tuned in to see how you were feeling, that is a kind of metacognition. But it's, as he said, it's knowing what's happening in your head or your emotions at any given moment without getting carried away by it, which is which is magic, is, is not getting carried away by it, right? It's because when we cultivate this skill of being mindful, we become better able to manage those feelings instead of inside of ourselves rather than acting them out. And there tends to be more space. So this is the animation about this was by Dan Harris. And this this is him when he had his panic attack when he was younger. Um, so let's take a look at how mindfulness helps panic. If you had told me a few years ago that I never panic attack when he was younger. Um, so let's take a look at how mindfulness helps pan. If you had told me a few years ago that I ever turned into an evangelist for meditation, I would have popped my beer up through my nose. Funny things happen though, and for me, it all started with a panic attack on national health. We're going to go now to a Dan Harris. This is the news desk. Good morning, Charlie and Daddy. It all went down back in 2004 when I was filling in on Good Morning America, and I suddenly lost the ability to breathe. News now, one of the world's most commonly prescribed medications may be providing a big bonus. Researchers report people who take cholesterol lowering drugs called statins for at least five years may also lower their risk for cancer. But it's too early to, to prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. Uh, that does it for news. We're going to go back now to Robin and Charlie. That was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. And according to the ratings, it was seen by 5.019 million people. At the root of my own air freak out was something I think most of us share, which is a desire to be great at what we do. 
I started as a reporter at ABC News in the year 2000. I was green and I was really insecure about being green and my way of coping with that was to become a workaholic. When 9-11 happened, not long after I arrived at ABC News, I raised my hand to go overseas to cover whatever happened next. This is a picture of me uh, with some nice young men from the Taliban in 2001, and for the ensuing years, I spent a lot of time in war zones. When I came home from one particularly long stretch in Iraq, I got depressed. Actually, I wasn't even consciously aware that I was depressed. And in an act of towering stupidity, I began to self-medicate, dabbling with cocaine and ecstasy. After my panic attack, I went to go see a doctor. To get to the bottom of what was going on, he asked me a series of questions, including, do you do drugs? Rather sheepishly, I said, yeah, I do. He leaned back in his chair and gave me a look that communicated the following sentence. Okay, idiot, mystery solved. He explained that even though my drug use was intermittent, it was enough to raise the level of adrenaline in my brain and prime me to have that panic attack. Completely coincidentally, at around this time, my boss and mentor, Peter Jennings, assigned me to cover faith and spirituality for ABC News. Over the following years, I visited more mosques, megachurches, and Mormon temples than I could count. I made a lot of really good friends and realized how ignorant I was on this issue. And it was this beat that ultimately led me to meditation, which, frankly, I always thought was bullshit. But then I heard about the explosion of scientific research into meditation. I should say this research is still in its early stages, but it is strongly suggestive of an almost laughably long list of benefits. These include lowering levels of stress hormones, lowering your blood pressure, and boosting your immune system. Meditation has also been shown to mitigate depression, anxiety, ADHD, and age-related cognitive decline. And check this out. A study at Harvard found that beginners who meditated for just eight weeks literally grew their gray matter in the areas of the brain associated with self-awareness and compassion. Meanwhile, the area of the brain associated with stress shrank. After trying it out for myself, I learned that meditation can also be kryptonite for the voice in your head, your ego, your inner narrative, the non-stop conversation you're having with yourself. This is the voice that compels us to do the stuff that we're most ashamed of, like eating that AT cookie or firing off that angry email, or in my case, going to war zones without considering the psychological consequences getting depressed without even knowing it, and then blindly self-medicate. I wrote 10% Happier because when I was getting started as a meditator, I couldn't find many introductory books that were geared towards skeptics or toward people who were raised in the age of irony. Since the book came out, a lot of people have been asking me how they too can get started, hence this course. Okay, so he, like I said, the 10% Happier app is a subscription app, but they have plenty for free that you can explore. And that just gives you an idea of where that video came from and, and how actively taking time to slow down our mind. Let's take a breath. Relax, 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 relax. Releasing that tension. Actively slowing down our mind helps us um, sort of untangle ourselves from being too enmeshed. Again, it's a kind of meta-awareness. We learn to hold what's inside us and what is around us in a more spacious awareness so that there's a bit, there's a buffer, as Harris um, mentioned, rather than being tangled up by. And ironically, we can be much closer with things um, when we're not totally enmeshed with them. It's like we can't enjoy the soup when we're in the soup, right? So. We can enjoy much more deeply when we're disentangled. So this is some of the sort of a case for mindfulness. So this is a slide that shows you too much going on. This this makes us very stressed and tired to have the default mode network always underway. And I want to remind you that you had written in the chat things that helped clear the default mode network. And much of this is a major case for how important it is for us to do those, you'll notice that a lot of those activities are zoom out activities rather than focused in activities. We're moving back out into the meta awareness place in our mind, right? We're allowing ourselves to open up and it's critical to do or we'll be sort of crippled by anxiety. 
Mindfulness is a metacognition where you learn to stay present in the moment, so you bring yourself back to now. And it, the kinds of um, like the examples that you gave, like listening music or walking your dog with your dog, are examples that naturally bring you into the now. And so we want to build and grow on what we're already naturally able to do. It enables us to step back and look at things and take care of our inner world rather than lash it out, right? Accept them for what they are, not be so identified or entangled with our experiences and things that happen and even the default mode network. So we're disentangling from the default mode network. So let's take a breath. And we're going to just encourage our body to relax, relax. We're just releasing those micro tensions that our muscles fill in all the time. So we're halfway through the slideshow now. I'm just going to apply your attention so you know where we are. Now, these kids are in a mindful, mindful schools course. I went through training with mindful schools, and I absolutely loved it. And we're just going to watch the trailer. Jenna, I think you're in Psych 36, the meditation and mindfulness class, right? So we will be watching this whole film, just so you know, um, in in our class in a couple of weeks. But the trailer is really it gives you a really good feel. Now, when you watch this trailer, you're going to see just sort of a short version. This you can watch the whole film down here. Um, for free, and I'll post it as an extra credit discussion for anybody who wants to watch the whole film and discuss it. If you're a teacher, if you're going to be a teacher or work with kids in any way, I urge you to watch this film um, because you're going to. This is an inner city school in Oakland, and inner city schools, you know, schools are funded largely by the real estate property taxes in the area. So schools in Urban areas that have uh, low-income urban areas are funded terribly. They don't. They have um, high student-to-teacher ratios. A lot of students for every teacher, and so it's much harder for those schools and and harder for the kids. The kids are living in more stressful environment. And what happened was they brought a little mindfulness program in just for a few moments, uh, for a few weeks with these kids. I think it was an eight-week. And they just did about 20 minutes of exercises a couple times a week for eight weeks. And you can watch what happens with these kids. You can also see these kids um, in this short little two minute trailer as an example of what's going on with us inside. So we can, we can feel like these kids, like how, what they're acting out, we can feel inside of ourselves. But as adults, we try to control it so we don't act it out quite like they are but we are still experiencing and then we act it out by having low impulse control when we get weary, right? So um, so you can see sort of an external reflection of what we're able to help cultivate within ourselves. Here we go. Get to know these kids when you watch the trailer. I mean, when you watch the film and you see that, I give it up. Including that teacher. They gotta bring a TV show about us. I had a very teacher conference and the teachers were talking bad about me. The principal said that they hate me because I've heard to the office one more time. She had to change school. I thought I was going listen. Just some humble kids. I really don't feel like my parents can understand me. No, that's awful. Yes, that's Okay, so 
We'll be learning some of the tools that the kids learned in this uh, short little video, including let's take a breath. And if you wish, put your hand on our heart. Let's just take a moment. If they can do it, we can do it. Let's wish for ourselves to be happier. Wish for themselves. Really good, everybody. Now let's take another breath. And we'll continue on with part two. So this is a five-minute guided meditation on going with the Tao by 7A. And 7A is a wonderful, this is from the 10% Happier app, and we're not going to play this right now. But I'm going to leave this for you with an encouragement that you check it out. Um, and this is more teachers that you can learn that are on the website. I'm not doing a plug for the site at all. You can do get plenty. I provide you plenty of these meditation resources for free. Um, now, what I want to encourage you to do if you want to incorporate a little bit more of this meditation into your life is to find a natural downtime. And I'll be posting a sequence of meditations that you can listen to on YouTube, I think. Excuse me, this one's on YouTube. Okay. And there's Deb Harris uh, talking to seven hey, everybody. And they have a short conversation. And then she leads her guided meditation. And it's these are these are short. This one's 20 minutes, but a lot of times they're 10 minutes. And you can see over here on the right side of the screen all these other 10%. There are these are all from this 10% happier um, interview series. So these meditations that they do. And Seven A just came out with a book called You Belong. Um, you can just, if you can find a downtime, a natural downtime in your day, maybe even right before bed, and give, you know, see if you can weave in a short meditation and you can pick from all these different teachers. And then each of these different teachers will have, if you find one whose voice and style you like, they will have meditations on their web links as well that you can watch on YouTube. So you could just type in your YouTube name. So just so you're aware of that. And like I said, it, it won't be for another week. I've already mentioned two extra credits that I'm going to be posting. One is a gratitude practice, and the other is um, watching that Room to Breathe video. But I won't be posting them for another week so that everybody has time to get in the groove of school. But just so you're aware. OK, I did it again. I got to plug in my computer. So. The Tao, you've probably heard a lot about the Tao. And this is the yin-yang symbol. And we'll, we'll talk more about what the yin-yang symbol symbolizes in more detail. But it basically symbolizes the whole, all right? And that, that our life here is a juxtaposition of opposites within the whole. So light and dark, day and night, good and bad, pleasure, pain, you know, um, things you like, things you don't like. Okay, so it's constantly uh, an interaction. And there's a little bit of each, so there's a little bit of light in the dark and dark and light. And this is a flowing symbol, like ocean waves going in and out. It's not static like it looks here. So try to capture a little bit of this movement. And the Tao is um, what it literally means is the way things are the reality of how things are. <laughs> and this symbol is connected to the Tao because it shows, it reflects how things are, meaning that life, even though we want all pleasure, is a combination of pleasure and pain. It's a back and forth that we experience them both. And in fact, in a sense, we almost need the other. We need the darkness to know that we're in the light, right? So. The Tao is about being willing to accept the way things are, allow, and to go with the flow. Okay, so we're going to look at a process. So this doesn't mean that, you, that in Taoism, which was um, is attributed to Lao Tzu, a great philosopher um, who wrote the Tao Te Ching, which is a series of reflections, wisdom reflections, that talk about, you know, in shorthand, it's it's allowing life to be like when the printer breaks, 
allowing the prayer to grow. Now, your animal body mind, which is not all you are, but we have that whole animal body. We learned last week that we have the reptilian brain, the limbic brain that our dogs have, um, that are core emotions. So think about somebody goes after your dog bone. So that animal part of our body reacts and responds to things, but we also have sort of higher chakra capacities, right? We have that the wisdom capacities, the higher vision, the metacognition capacities that we can cultivate so that we can disentangle ourselves from our more um, sort of primal nature. An example of society doing this is when we shift it as a, as a human species from might equals right, you know, where the strongest are the winners to um, fairness, justice, equity. That was a huge cognitive leap that we did as an entire species because the animal kingdom does not run by that, that by that um, way of thinking. So we have we have higher capacities that we begin so that we can literally evolve ourselves. So learning to be willing to accept what happens, not forever, like you're going to fix the printer, but letting go of reactivity and releasing like you know some people who have an experience and then they amp it up they make it worse right we call them usually drama kings and queens right they turn so this is deliberately dialing that back down implementing the process of de drama king and queen everything which enhances our higher nature capacities now you learn this from a neuroscience point of view that it takes us out of our more primal animal nature up into the higher parts of our brain, right? So that we can accept rather than uh, fight things. And the sooner that we can shift to accepting and being willing to accept. And that's what the Tao is. The Tao is being willing to accept how things are, which is something that our default mode network doesn't like because our default mode network wants everything to go the way we want it to go for ourselves and it gets mad when things don't but things are not going to because of the nature of reality so things are often you know it's rare that all the plates of our lives are up in the air at the same time so we can learn we can train ourselves to move more in the flow with the way of life and not fight the moments of our life so much let's take a breath when you breathe in your one part, you're sort of doing the yang part of the yin yang. When you breathe out, you're doing the yin or the releasing, relaxing part. So you're doing the yin yang as you breathe. And each time you breathe out, you're letting go. And it's a practice of letting go so that we can, you know, I release and I let go it can be a training rather than clinging, which the Buddha said causes us to be anxious and unhappy. So in chapter three, Hansen points out there are three practices that can help us manage challenge. Let be, let go, and let in. And this is a really nice mantra practice. Okay, so allowing what is is letting be. This is the doubt. This is like, okay, the printer broke. This is how it is. I take a breath. And I soothe my angry default mode network animal nature, right? So it's raining, we might have a reactivity that we don't like it, but we can also allow it. We can go, that's how it is. I mean, Lao Tzu said, we're fools to fight with what already is. We can fight for what we want to change next, but we can't really fight what's already happened, right? So allowing what is, so that's let be. And that's allowing ourselves to notice what's there, right? So this is when he gets cut off in traffic and he takes a step back into the metacognition and he notices the swirl of feelings going within him and he lets them be. Then he's also willing to let them go rather than cling to them and create a storyline about what a jerk that driver was and so on. And there's a big hook. Now notice that the neural paths of um, the default mode network which we can often interpret as our ego, right? Our ego itself. It's not our whole ego, but it's a part of it. It informs our ego, especially if we over-identify with it. So 
we can allow life to be, we can see life how it really is. We can make a, a willingness to go, okay, things aren't always going to go my way, and I can learn to accept that without having, without continually getting upset about it. That's the idea behind don't sweat the small stuff. Then we can let it go. We can decrease the negativity by releasing it and allowing it to let go. They say that uh, an emotion like getting pissed off that somebody cut you off in traffic only lasts a couple of minutes at the most, like 90 seconds to a minute and a half. So that seems surprising, but what we keep it going with is with the ego default network that then um, starts a rumination on how that's not fair, that's BS, shouldn't happen, and so on. So, which lots of would say, yeah, it should happen because it already happened. So arguing against what already happened is useless. It's a waste of energy. It, 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 it shifts your energy from having fresh energy to fix it for the future, right? To make changes. And, it, and you can see this in a microcosm when the printer breaks that you get mad about it, but it's not until you start to calm down that you're able to actually fix it, right? Because if you start to fix it when you're mad, then you usually do something that may, takes it longer to fix, right? Because of the amygdala attack. And then letting in is so. So this is a literal practice of like you're driving down the road, you get cut off in traffic, you notice those feelings in metacognition, you notice the feeling pits. You know, and I did this last night. My partner said something kind of that I, I was in a stress mode. So in a stress mode, I was feeling pressure. In a stress mode, I I'm more likely to interpret the income comment from my partner as like if if, if it's nuance and a person could take it you know um neutrally or could take it with a negative spin being stressed will make us more vulnerable to taking it with a negative spin and so i respond with a bit of a negative spin like as if he said it negatively but i noticed within myself that i, and I don't succeed at this all the time that's not i mean the practice of it is what helps us get good. It's not like we're instantly, but I'm way better at it than I was. And so I noticed, I was, so I shifted my attention to me and soothing and calming and allowing those emotions and allowing those emotions to go and then letting in something positive, shifting to green, looking and noticing something beautiful around you. And it's very easy and simple to do. So I'd like to encourage you guys to do that. Let's take a breath. And just open your eyes and look around your room and let your your eyes light on something. And just notice it. Let something interesting or beautiful or pleasant or playful or something that you love in, right? Like I really like my orange fizzy drink. So it's sort of like then I can shift to feeling gratitude. Now, this is a particularly useful exercise when we don't want to rehearse negative neural pathways, remember that scene of the neural pathways growing like rows. And when we rehearse something, it, it grows in a row, in group, including getting annoyed, right? So we want to shift as quickly as we can from those unnecessary things. There are sometimes we need to uh, sort through emotions and figure out why we're going through painful emotions. But other times, it's a... Uh, it's really best for us to be able and willing to just simply release it and let it go and shift, right? Pivot to a, a better space, something that you're grateful for. So letting go is about leaving the red zone as soon as you can, as soon as that is appropriate, particularly with the small stuff, right? So you can be mindful, tune in, and let your feelings know. I think it's really important that we talk to our, that we don't, our default mode network enables us to run on autopilot before we're conscious. So it was a critical part of human evolution. And so we want to be appreciative of it. But now that we're conscious, now that we're awake, we want to let it know that we can take the helm more and it can relax more. So we want to be kind to it. And we want to be kind to our feelings too. So a speed, you're, you're taking care of your own internal systems is one of the most interesting things. You're taking care as you take a breath. And we relax, relax, relax. We're taking care of the kingdom of our body. We're helping our body uh, replenish itself. We're boosting the immune system by relaxing it. And the same thing with our mind. 
when we when we let our feelings know that we understand them and that we have compassion for them, they can release their grip much faster. And this is the same for ourselves. When somebody comes to us and we're upset and somebody is caring about our feelings, our feelings relax way faster than if we go to somebody and we're expressing our feelings and our feelings are, um, you know, they ignore our feelings. And then you can decide if you want to let go and, and release. So you can let go when we breathe out. We can let go of tension in our body. And we can let in, which is cultivating the responsive mode. So um, once again, I want to ask you to write something else that cultivates the responsive mode in you. One thing that cultivates the responsive mode in me is hugging my dog. Um, and my husband and I have a playful thing that we do this um, that, I mean, these are just, we call this an uplift, but where it sort of shifts you to the green mode and helps you feel a little bit better. Now, these kinds of things release natural opioids in our mind and settle the brain's stress machinery. Thinking about things we're grateful for and glad about and things that make us smile is it cultivates our responsive mode, cultivating with people, being imaginative cultivates us why creativity often cultivates responsive mode as long as we're not in a judgmental space about it. Letting yourself feel cared about, recognizing your own warm heart cultivates it. Um, and noticing the thoughts and perspectives that you have within you, reading sometimes wisdom from others that are active, useful, and wise, cultivates in responsive mode. So really good to write down some of the things, other things, second set of things that cultivate the responsive mode in you. So we're expanding our repertoire of things that already bring you to a state of mindfulness. Because when we build and grow on strengths we already have, right? So you expand it and dive into it and savor those moments a little bit more. Bye, Eileen. Great to have you here. So we talked about um, self-directed neuroplasticity. And remember, neuroplasticity is that we can wire our brain ourselves based on um, what we do and our brain wires according to the experiences we have right so we can deliberately add experiences that develop our brain the way we want it to grow right so we're building these neural connections you can see this small picture but these neural connections are growing stronger right slowly but surely one of the ways we can do that is by dropping into and really savoring our experiences so when you have those positive experiences that you wrote about, like walking outside or riding horses, drop into it a bit more deeply, right? So really feel it more deeply. You're grooving in the neuro, you know, the experience of feeling good. You're literally grooving in those neurons and feeling good more deeply when you do that. And then this is the talk I didn't think we had time for, but it looks like we might, and it's really worth a listen. This is Shana Shapira about what you practice sort of stronger. So I'm going to go ahead and play it. Let's see if I have. Oh, and then here is a link to those guided meditations, a whole bunch of them, if you'd like to listen to any of them and start that relaxation practice. But let's go ahead and listen to Shana. She's going to talk about mindfulness a little bit. And then we'll close. When we're meditating, I can see if you could take um, three deep breaths in the process of this, or maybe even just settle in. You can see it's 13 minutes long. So see if you can allow yourself to relax and move into a nice, natural, deep breathing cycle. And in rush hour traffic, you can remain perfectly calm. If you can see your neighbors travel to fantastic places without a twinge of jealousy, if you can love everyone around you unconditionally, and if you can always find contentment just where you are, then you're probably a dog, <laughs> right? We hold ourselves to these unrealistic standards of perfection, and then we judge ourselves when we don't live up to them. 
The thing is, we're not supposed to be perfect. Perfection isn't possible. But transformation is. All of us have the capacity to change, to learn, and to grow, no matter what our circumstances. As a professor of scientist, I study how people change, how people transform. And one of the most effective vehicles that I found is mindfulness. My own journey to mindfulness was unexpected. When I was 17, I had a spinal fusion surgery, a metal rod put in my spine. I went from a healthy, active teenager to lying in a hospital bed unable to walk. And during the many months of rehabilitation, I tried to figure out how to live in this body that could no longer do what it used to. The physical pain was difficult, but worse was the fear and the loneliness. And I simply didn't have the tools to cope. So I began searching for something that could help. And eventually the search led me to a monastery in Thailand for my first meditation retreat. At the monastery, the monks didn't speak much English. And I didn't speak any Thai, but I understood mindfulness had something to do with paying attention in the present moment. My only instruction was to feel the breath going in and out of my nose. So I began one breath, two breaths. My mind wandered off. I brought it back. One breath, two breaths. It wandered again, sucked into the past or lost in the future. And no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't stay present. Now this is frustrating because I thought meditation was supposed to feel like this. And instead, it felt more like this. <laughs> right? Being present isn't so easy. In fact, check it out for yourself. I've been speaking for about three minutes. Have you noticed your mind has wandered? All of our minds wander. Research from Harvard shows the mind wanders on average 47% of the time, 47%. That's almost half of our lives that we're missing, that we're not here. So part of mindfulness is simply learning to train the mind in how to be here, where we are all. Like right now, let us practice together. Allow your eyes to close and just feel your feet on the floor. Wiggle your toes and sense your whole body sitting here, softening the face, softening the jaw, and notice that you're breathing, feeling the breath as it naturally flows in and out of the body, just being here. And as you're ready, taking a deeper breath in and out, allowing your eyes to open, so, back at the monastery, I was trying hard to do just this, to just be present. But no matter how hard I tried, my mind kept wandering off. And at this point, I really started to judge myself. What is wrong with you? You're terrible at this. Why are you even here? You're a fake. And then not only was I judging myself, I started judging everyone, even the monks. Why are they just sitting here? Should they be doing something? Thankfully, a monk from London arrived to spoke English, and as I shared with him my struggles, he looked at me and said, oh dear, you're not practicing mindfulness. You're practicing judgment, impatience, frustration. And then he said five words that have never left him. What you practice grows stronger. What you practice grows stronger. We know this now with neuroplasticity. Our repeated experiences shape our brain. We can actually sculpt and strengthen our synaptic connection based on repeated practice. For example, in the same study of London taxi drivers, the visual spatial mapping part of the brain is bigger, stronger. They've been practicing navigating the 25,000 streets of London all day long. When you look at the brain's meditative, the area is related to attention, learning, compassion, grow bigger and stronger. It's called cortical thickening the growth of new neurons in response to repeated practice. What we practice grows stronger. The monk explains to me that if I was meditating with judgment, I was just growing judgment. Meditating with frustration, I'm growing frustration. He helped me understand that mindfulness isn't just about paying attention. It's about how we pay attention, with kindness. He said it's like these loving arms that welcome everything 
even in the messy and perfect parts of ourselves. He also pointed out that we're practicing all the time, moment by moment, not just when we're meditating, but in every moment. We're growing something in every moment. So the question really becomes, what do you want to grow? What do you want to practice? When I left Thailand, I wanted to keep practicing mindfulness. And I wanted to understand it scientifically. So I began a PhD program, eventually became a professor. And I've spent the past 20 years investigating the effects of mindfulness across a wide range of populations, including veterans with PTSD, patients with insomnia, women with breast cancer, stressed out college students, high-level business executives. And over and over, the data showed two key things. First, mindfulness works. It's good for you. It strengthens our immune functioning, it decreases stress, decreases cortisol, helps us sleep better. When we published our first research back in 98, there were only a handful of studies. Now there are thousands of studies showing the beneficial effects of mindfulness. It's good for us. The second thing we learned was quite unexpected. Almost all of the people we were working with, regardless of their age or gender or background, were talking about the same thing. This underlying sense of, I'm not good enough, I'm not okay, I'm not living this life right. This is tremendous self-judgment and shame. And we all know what they are talking about because shame is universal. All of us feel it. And in words, we have this mistaken belief that if we shame ourselves, if we beat ourselves up, we'll somehow improve. And yet, shame doesn't work. She never works. It can't work. Literally, physiologically, it can't work because when we feel shame, the centers of the brain that do growth and learning shut down. This fMRI shows the brain on a shame. What happens is the amygdala triggers a cascade of norepinephrine and cortisol to flood our system, shutting down the learning centers and shuttling our resources to survival pathways. Shame literally robs the brain of the energy it needs to do the work of change. And in words, when we feel shame, we want to avoid it. So we hide from those parts of ourselves where shame is. The parts that most need our attention. It's just too painful to look at them. So what's the alternative? Kind attention. First, Kindness gives us the courage to look at those parts of ourselves we don't want to see. And second, kindness bathes us with dopamine, turning on the learning centers of the brain and giving us the resources we need to change. True and lasting transformation requires kind attention. And the monk's words echoed in my ears. Mindfulness isn't just about attention. It's about kind attention. This attitude of kindness wasn't just a footnote or something nice to have. It was an essential part of the practice. A part of mindfulness that is so often overlooked. So my colleagues and I developed a model of mindfulness that explicitly includes our attitude and our intention as well as our attitude. All three parts working together synergistically. But simply, mindfulness is intentionally paying attention with kindness. We use this model while working at the Veterans Hospital for a group of men with PTSD. I was shocked to learn that we lose more veterans to suicide each year than to combat. Our soldiers carry so much pain and shame. So the intention of the mindfulness group was to cultivate this kind of attention, even for the seemingly unforgivable parts of ourselves. There was one man in the room who never said a word, never looked back. Two months passed, he seemed unreachable. And then one day he raised his hand and he said, I don't want to get better. What I saw in war, what I did, I don't deserve to get better. He then looked down at the floor and proceeded to tell us in great detail what he had seen and what he had done. And I can still feel the horror in what he shared and how his shame filled the room. 
I looked, looked up, up to see how the other men were responding, and there was no judgment, only compassion on their faces. I invited him to look up and to witness this compassion and this kindness. And as he slowly looked around the room, his face began to soften. And in his eyes, there was hope. The possibility that he wasn't just his past action, that he could choose differently now that he could change. And this may be one of the most important things that I've learned. It's that transformation is possible for all of us, no matter what. And it requires kind of attention, not shame. And this kind of attention takes practice. It takes lots of practice. I want to share with you a simple practice that continues to help me. Some years ago, I was going through a difficult divorce, and I'd wake up every morning with this pit of shame in my stomach. My meditation teacher suggested an explicit practice of kind of meditation. She said, I about saying I love you, Shana, every day. I thought to myself, no way. It felt so contrived. She saw my hesitation and suggested, how about just saying good morning, Shana? Oh, and if I put your hand on your heart when you say it, it releases oxytocin and it's good for you to know. She made a sign to win me over. So the next day, put my hand on my heart, took a breath and said, good morning. And it was kind of nice. I continued to practice. A month later when I saw her, I admitted how helpful it had been. Wonderful, you've graduated, she said. Now, the advanced practice. Good morning, I love you. So the next day, Put my hand on my heart, anchored my mouth, and said, Good morning. I love you. Felt oh, nothing, except maybe a little ridiculous, but definitely not love. But I kept practicing because, as we know, what we practice grows stronger. And then one day, I put my hand on my heart, took a breath. Morning. I love you. And then I felt it. I felt my grandmother's love. I felt my mother's love. I felt my own soft love. And I wish I could tell you that every day I send a sentence in this bubble of self love and I've never felt shame or judgment again. That's not true. But what is true is the pathway of kind of attention has been established and it's growing stronger every day. So I want to invite you tomorrow to put your hand on your heart and say good morning. And if you're really brave, Good morning. I love you. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to ask you all as we begin to close our lecture today to write down as the last quiz question. What your favorite thing you learned was, I'll buzz through the slideshow again, because we've been on a big journey, steady in mind, talked about the default mode network and how it, it runs like a hamster wheel, it's on autopilot, it just runs. But we can help teach it to relax. <laughs> and one of the things it needs is to be safe, satisfied, and connected. We'll come back to these three human needs as we go on through the course and we can one practice I do with myself to help myself is when I feel agitated, I ask myself, what do I need? What do I need right now to feel better? And it tends to be related to a feeling of the need to feel safe, satisfied, and connected. And it's a really helpful thing to do. It's a, it's a kindfulness practice for yourself. So we talked about how in the East they called the, the default mode network, the monkey mind filled with all these random thoughts that run into your head and want to emphasize again that the thoughts are not you because you can actually observe the shock thoughts with the light of your awareness. You can watch them with your metacognition. And we also talked about how our mind does things metacognition. We're able to do things on purpose like imagine and intention. We started talking about why mindfulness is a superpower, which gave you insights on how the metacognitive state of mindfulness works when you're sort of stepping back and you're able to see everything, you're able to actually appreciate things more. 
when you can take a little bit of a step back. That's one of those ironies. We listened to Dan Harris talk about his experience of what got him into practicing meditation, which helps us with mindfulness as well as doing mindfulness practices. And a mindfulness practice um, is stop and take a breath. So let's take a breath and feel our body disentangle a little bit from the tension we've been feeling or maybe picked up. So we talked about how mindfulness, the state of mindfulness of taking a step back and observing helps us um, disentangle and not be so enmeshed with the experiences of our lives in this little image is a graphic image that illustrates it. This is some of the things that are elemental to mindfulness. And we looked at the kids from mindful schools and how they were able to soothe and their personal wish, which is a mindful wish. You know, Shauna shared, good morning, I love you. If that one feels awkward, we could begin with good morning or I wish for myself to be happy. And pausing once a day with your hand on your heart and taking a breath and just giving yourself that wish once a day would be a wonderful, mindful exercise that I encourage everybody to begin with. This is a five-minute meditation with 7A that I'll post separately um, in the 10% Happier Life link. If you'd like to begin to take some 5 or 10, 15-minute breaks and begin to incorporate this into your life a little bit. We talked about the Tao, which is... The Tao really means the way of life. This is the way of life. And we talked about... You can see how this is kind of a flow symbol. So... That life has a flow to it, and there's a oneness, and within the oneness, a duality. So when we're in life, we experience the duality of pleasure and pain, but mindfulness is almost a sense of like zooming out. So you're a little bit, there's a, there's a buffer between over-experiencing things. So we talked about that the Tao is about allowing things to be as they are and not fighting with reality as it is. I mean, that doesn't mean you don't want to change things, but this moment, not fighting with this very moment, maybe fighting for changes in the future, but allowing this moment. And that's the idea of letting be. And the idea of mindfulness putting some more into the responsive brain where we have more power to choose how we want to react. So the let be, let go, let in is a great three-part practice to just make a natural part of your life. It's a kind of mindfulness practice when you notice yourself experiencing something like getting cut off in traffic or anything similar like that. The three-step process of allowing, okay, I'm pissed right now. But it's like, oh, this is what it's like to be pissed. But then releasing it rather than going on a ride with it, going on a cognitive sort of egoic ride with it, and then letting in the new child's mind, opening the, the new. And what we're doing here is we're breaking the circuit of programmed negativity or habitual negativity. Um, so this just goes through the stages of allowing what is with let be, let go, and let in. So letting go, deciding when we're ready, we can take a breath. And then release, and our exhale is an example of letting go. And can remind us of how good it is to let go all the time, that it feels good to let go. And then letting in is really allowing ourselves to sort of steep, like you steep your tea, steep yourself a little bit into those positive experiences so those neural connections grow stronger of positive experiences, offsetting the negativity bias of the brain, right? So in a sense, all the let be, let go, let in very much sort of counters the negativity bias of the brain by um, being willing to let go rather than groove in that neuron of unhappiness and groove in and then deciding to groove in the, the neural structures of our more contented experiences. Now, that's not to say there aren't some experiences that we have that take more time and attention. 
then quickly let be, let go, let in. But often we have experiences during the day that are micro experiences that we can let go. There are, and it also doesn't mean that we don't want to take proactive um, action to support our own needs. We do, and it is something we'll specifically talk about in here. But again, often we can get into a better habit of don't sweat the small stuff rather than freak out over the small stuff. So we're, and the brain is sort of organized to freak out over the small stuff. So don't fault yourself. That's, that's how it's structured and what, we're, what you're learning here is really mastery level information. So experience dependent neuroplasticity means we can, that our brain changes in response to experience. And so we are deciding what kind of experiences by setting our intentions that we want to give. And then we listen to Shana Shapiro's very beautiful talk about what you practice with a stronger reinforcing these points. So if we could close by, let's take a breath. And then just jot in what was your favorite insight from today that you most want to remember and you can write that down and then share an expression of goodwill to your colleagues like i wish you all a wonderful week or can't wait to see you next week or hope you have a good one or anything like that that is an expression of goodwill and connection to your colleagues because these these mindful acts of vocalizing our feelings of goodwill also very much help cultivate a green brain because again one of our core needs is to feel connected and one of the most efficient ways to feel connected is to extend care to express care right rather than waiting for care to be given to us we shift that and decide that we will become the source of care for others because everybody out there needs it and then this last slide is a resource for guided meditations with that 10% happier link if you would like to explore that. Well, thank you everybody very much for today's course. Looks like we did a pretty good job of almost finishing on time. I very much.